phone. At this time, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Jan Cobble. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome. And thank you to everyone for participating, both those here now for the live program and those listening in the future. So today is the third webinar in the summer series. It's this terrific new venue that FICA has provided. Most of us are familiar with FICA services through their live presentations and workshops that are offered on a local, regional, and national level. And so it's been really great to be able to reach out to people both time-wise and distance-wise on a regular basis this summer. So today's focus is going to be a primer on differentiated thyroid cancer. We're very lucky, very fortunate to have Dr. MacGyver here, who is from the renowned Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's a, Dr. MacGyver is an endocrinologist who really has a, a very focused interest, and that is on thyroid cancer. He is a clinician. He also does clinical research and basic research. But again, his, prim his primary focus is, pr is patient care in thyroid cancer. Dr. MacGyver is a member of the American Thyroid Association Thyroid Cancer Guidelines Development Group. This group that, that produces the guidelines certainly provides a service that all of us appreciate, and it really represents a terrific benefit to the medical community. So before I turn this over to Dr. MacGyver, I would like to remind you all that that any of the information that Dr. MacGyver shares with us, whether it be in the presentation or in the subsequent question and answer period, is not intended to represent medical advice, but rather medical information and knowledge. And mentioning questions, please be sure to write down your questions and submit them for, for, um, for discussion during the question and answer period after the presentation. I will be reviewing the questions and compiling them and then asking them directly to Dr. MacGyver after his presentation. And I think that was all of my work that I needed to do right now, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. MacGyver. Dr. MacGyver, welcome. Thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you to FICA and Gary Bloom, the organizer, for inviting me to come and speak about my favorite topic, which is the uh, uh, treatment and management and follow-up of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. I would like this to be an introductory talk, and so I will try to keep it uh, accessible to people who may have only uh, mild experience of thyroid cancer, but I think that an awful lot of the topics I'm going to discuss uh, have uh, complicated issues behind them, and I certainly would be happy to have uh, those complicated questions addressed in the question and answer session afterwards, and I hope that will be a very vigorous uh, session. Uh, I'll be happy to tackle all the tough problems at that stage. Um, what I'd really like to do is to talk about uh, the types of thyroid cancer and how that influences our ability to manage that cancer, how it influences the prognosis and the follow-up of that cancer. I'll talk some about the staging of thyroid cancer and how that influences how we think about the disease and the patients who suffer from it. I will spend a little time talking about appropriate surgery for thyroid cancer because surgery remains the keystone of our management of this disease. We'll talk about radioactive iodine and we'll have a little time in there to talk about the challenges with thyrogen, uh, particularly the supply of thyrogen right now in the use of radioactive iodine treatments and monitoring. I'll talk about the monitoring of thyroid cancer after that treatment and a little uh, time at the end on managing residual and recurrent disease if, the, if we have the chance to do that. I'm going to try and keep my comments down to around 40 minutes or so so that there's plenty of time at the end for uh, questions and for those answers to come back and clarify the situation. When I think about thyroid cancer, I think about it as a balance amongst several different components. I think about the tumor, the type of tumor, the biology of that tumor, the patterns of growth and spread and, and uh, invasion of that tumor. I think about the time since that tumor first developed, which translates uh, into the extent of the tumor. Obviously, a tumor that's slow growing that's left long enough will eventually grow to be a large tumor. Uh, cancer in general has a tendency to invade, and the longer it's there, the deeper it has a chance to extend its roots. And the longer it's present as well, and the bigger it becomes, the more the chance that it has to spread. So that tumor extent interacts with the tumor biology and histology, 
but we should never forget that it also interacts with the patient in which it's growing. Uh, that patient's underlying physiology, their immune system, their health in general, also has a big role to play in the outcome of thyroid cancer. And I think we need to keep in mind the interaction between patient factors, tumor histology, the type of tumor, the tumor growth patterns, and the extent to which the tumor has spread and invaded as we begin to approach the management of thyroid cancer. To start off with the tumor histology and biology, uh, we know from many, many years of experience that there are several different types of thyroid cancer. The most common one, and the one that we see here at Mayo more than 80% of the time, is papillary thyroid cancer. Um, there are less common versions of thyroid cancer. They all are derived from the thyroid, but they look differently and they behave differently. Uh, follicular thyroid cancer tends to be a little more aggressive than the papillary. Herthal cell cancer, which is often more invasive than the follicular or the papillary. There's anaplastic thyroid cancer, and there's been a previous webinar specifically dedicated to that rare cancer. It's a devastating and dangerous disease. And then there's medullary cancer, and medullary is one cancer that I'm not going to touch on because, again, there's a separate webinar that's already been conducted on the medullary cancer, and it's available. So I'm going to focus instead on the papillary, the follicular, and the Herthel cell cancers today. These are the appearance under the microscope of these different cancers, and these cancers are really grouped according to what the pathologist sees when he or she looks down the microscope. In the top right corner, the common papillary cancer labeled PTC uh, has certain unique features about those dark areas called nuclei within the cell, specific patterns of those which the pathologist can often recognize even on a very small biopsy, but certainly on surgical pathology. The pathologist is rarely going to have a problem diagnosing that malignancy. Follicular cancer in the top left has a tendency to be a bit more invasive. It's a little harder to diagnose on small biopsies, but again, it should be a straightforward diagnosis for the pathologist on the final surgical pathology. The Herthel cell cancer in the bottom left it often raises concerns because Herthel cell cancer has a really bad reputation for being hard to diagnose and even harder to treat. Our own data suggests that Herthel cell cancer is very much along the same lines as follicular cancer when it comes to prognosis uh, once it's matched for the extent of the disease. And there in the bottom right is the most devastating of the cancers, the anaplastic thyroid cancer, which I hope nobody here ever has to face or deal with. The reason that I say that is because anaplastic thyroid cancer is extremely dangerous. Uh, that anaplastic cancer traditionally has um, a more than 90% death rate after less than six months. It's a devastating disease and very dangerous indeed. Our more common types of thyroid cancer, the follicular cancer, the Herthel cell cancer, and the papillary cancer have much lower risks of patients dying of this disease. So papillary cancer, if you're diagnosed with that disease, the chance of you dying of that disease over 25 or 35 or 40 years is around about 5 or 6 percent. That means 94, 95 percent of patients who are diagnosed with that disease live a normal life expectancy. That does not make it a good cancer, but it does make it a lot less dangerous than the other types of thyroid cancer. Herthel cell cancer and follicular cancers uh, over that 25 or 30 years kill approximately one out of every three patients that they affect. I don't think that that cancer is a good cancer, for sure, but again, with proper treatment and with proper early in, uh, intervention, especially with surgery, we can often salvage the situation very effectively. So we have good treatments available for these differentiated thyroid cancers. We spent a lot of time in the lab over the last 20 years or more learning about what drives these cancers, what makes them grow and makes them develop. And I put up this fairly complicated slide just to emphasize how much detail there is in the uh, understanding that we have about the development of thyroid cancer from normal thyroid tissues towards the papillary cancer, uh, towards follicular adenomas, which are benign, and follicular cancers, which are malignant. We know much less about the development of Herthel cell cancers, although we are beginning to gather some information about those as well. And we do believe that the anaplastic thyroid cancer, known as ATC, is a 
a form of uh, these thyroid cancers that goes through a series of steps called de-differentiation, a becoming more aggressive as it becomes more and more disturbed the longer it stays there. But most of these cancers never progress to anaplastic thyroid cancer. They do stop at the stage of papillary, follicular, or Herthel cell cancer. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about BRAF status, and you'll hear that mentioned often when you're speaking to physicians about thyroid cancer. BRAF is one of the genetic abnormalities, the genetic steps that leads to the development of papillary cancer and that may influence its behavior. And I think as we uh, move forward with our understanding of this molecular biology, so we're going to get better and better at defining the biology of the disease, not based on its appearance under the microscope, but instead based on its, uh, on its appearance in the test tube, on its genetic abnormalities and its other mutations. Uh, we're not at that point yet. Most centers are not yet giving you a genetic type of cancer. They're simply still describing it according to the pathology report. But I think the next five to 10 years holds a great deal of promise in that regard. What about patient factors as opposed to tumor factors? Well. I think we can all recognize that this young woman in the left-hand side of your slide uh, who has a very tiny focus of papillary cancer within an enlarged thyroid gland is a very, very different situation from the older gentleman in the right panel who has a deeply invasive cancer you can see on that CAT scan. This is not just a difference between the two tumors, it's also a difference between the two patients. One of the interesting things about thyroid cancer, and I think it's unique in any cancer type is that the age of the patient really makes a huge difference as to whether that patient is going to do well after cancer treatment or badly after cancer treatment. Quite arbitrarily, we as clinicians and investigators in thyroid cancer have drawn a dividing line at the age of 45. And we say people who are less than 45 are young, and people who are 45 and older are old which is a bit depressing because I feel pretty old now myself being over 50. But the reason that we do that is because thyroid cancer prognosis, the chance of living or dying with this disease, gets substantially worse in older patients. If you're 50, 60, 70 or beyond, uh, the cancer is generally going to be a much more aggressive form of cancer and your response to it will, will be less effective than if you're 15, 20 or 25 years old is not the only thing that counts, but it is one of the most important variables. There are other variables that seem to matter as well. Uh, perhaps the gender matters. Women who get much more thyroid cancer than men do, on average, do better with the disease. The men seem to do less well with the disease. Nowadays, we also think about immunosuppression from cancer. We think about the drugs that we might use to treat rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory diseases. We think about HIV and hepatitis and all of those types of infection that can suppress the immune system somewhat. And there's at least theoretical reasons to think that immune suppression may allow cancer of the thyroid to become uh, more rapidly progressive and become more of a threat. It's uncertain exactly what role that plays, but it's something that we are looking at and investigating carefully. And then, of course, there's the extent of the tumor. Patient factors matter, the tumor type matters, the biology of that tumor matters, the genetics matter, but so does the extent by the time it's diagnosed. Uh, I saw a young man this morning who clearly has had that cancer for many years, undiagnosed, and he has much more extensive disease. I saw a young woman earlier this morning who has been caught much earlier, and it's no question in my mind that that young woman with the early diagnosis is going to have a better outcome, even though the cancer is the same and many of the patient factors are similar. So how do we classify these tumors in terms of their extent? Well, the American Joint Commission on Cancer, the AGACC, has a tumor classification that most endocrinologists and all oncologists will uh, use to describe the extent of the cancer. And it's technically, uh, I think, quite straightforward to understand. Um, a T1 tumor, which is actually the most common, is any tumor that's less than two centimeters arising in the thyroid gland. A T2 tumor is a little bigger, anywhere from 2 to 4 centimeters. A T3 tumor is either a much larger tumor, bigger than 4 centimeters, that's about 2 and a half inches or so, or one that has its roots into the surrounding soft tissue, a little minimal invasion into the soft tissues. 
And then we define a T4 tumor as a tumor that has extensive invasion, deep roots into the soft tissues of the neck. And very clearly, that's a much less attractive situation, a much less happy situation than some of these earlier tumors. We also think about lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes in the neck seem to be there in part to capture the cancer cells that leave the thyroid gland. It's interesting that papillary cancer especially tends to leave the thyroid early. And so many patients with quite small tumors will actually have some lymph nodes involved, typically what are known as level six lymph nodes. And you'll see in the right-hand column there, uh, one of the more recent classifications says if level six lymph nodes are involved, that's the central part of the neck, then we classify this as an N1A cancer. On the other hand, if that uh, cancer is spread into lymph nodes elsewhere in the neck, either in the upper part of the chest or in the right or left sides of the neck, we classify that as an N1B cancer. And N1B is, of course, more advanced. The picture on your screen right now is how we break, out, break down the parts of the neck into those different regions. And you can see the region V1, or region 6, is that central part of the neck where the thyroid gland used to live before the surgery. Regions 2, 3, and 4 run along the jugular vein and the carotid artery from the ear at the top uh, down to the collarbone at the bottom. Region 5 is at the back of the neck, and region 7 is down in the upper part of the chest. So your surgeon will have a very good idea of where he took the lymph nodes, he or she took the lymph nodes out, uh, where those lymph nodes were living, and the pathologist will then classify as N1A or N1B. Often, we'll use the ultrasound to help guide us where those lymph nodes are. And again, the ultrasound, and you can see a picture on your screen now of a typical ultrasound for a papillary cancer contained in a lymph node, uh, that ultrasound will be able to define the node status. And the standard recommendation from the American Thyroid Association, and something we've been doing for many years here and in most other centers, is to map out these lymph nodes with ultrasound prior to the original surgery. That's really important because if we find the lymph nodes, say, high in the right side of the neck, we know that the surgeon has to go in there and clear out those lymph nodes, if at all possible, uh, at, as part of the initial surgery so that we're not facing the problem of leftover cancer. So an ultrasound scanning, very, very useful tool both before the first surgery and in terms of the follow-up. So we've got the size of the tumor and whether it's deeply invasive. We've got the lymph nodes being involved. That's the second step. And the third step is whether the disease has spread to other locations. Uh, fortunately, papillary thyroid cancer, which is the most common, especially in younger people, tends to spread into other organs at a relatively late stage, at an advanced stage of the disease. So it's actually relatively uncommon to find distant metastatic spread. In young people, if we're going to find that spread, we find it in the lungs. And we should always be looking at the lungs and with that in mind. In older patients, especially older patients with follicular cancer or with Herthel cell cancer, the spread of the disease is going to be in a different pattern. And oftentimes it will involve bone, it will involve soft tissues, it will sometimes involve liver, and rarely in late stages of the disease can even involve the brain and the skin and many, many other organs. It becomes a really a serious problem at that stage. So we take the size of the tumor, the extent of its invasion, the lymph nodes being involved, and the distant spread of that disease, and we classify patients according to a stage. And you can see in the left-hand column on your screen stages 1, 2, 3, and then stages 4A, 4B, and 4C. So there's really six stages of this disease. And this is where the age comes in uniquely for thyroid cancer. If the patient is less than 45 years old, then we say that you can only have one of two stages. You have stage one disease if the disease is contained in the neck, whether it's in the lymph nodes or the soft tissues or the thyroid. And you have stage two disease if that disease has spread outside the neck, typically into the lung. Only two stages. Why only two stages? Because even patients who are uh, diagnosed with disease that spread into the lungs, if they're less than 45 years old, their prognosis still is generally pretty favorable. Not perfect, but favorable. By the time you're more than 45, and especially if you're 50 or 60 or 70, 
then it's a lot more difficult to deal with this disease, uh, even if it hasn't spread into the lungs. And so we have these six different stages. If you have a small tumor, but you're older than 45, you'll be stage one. Larger tumor, stage two. Lymph nodes in the central part of the neck, the so-called N1A, will be stage three. Lymph nodes elsewhere, stage four disease. And that's a scary thing to be told as a patient, that you have stage four cancer. It sounds awful. The interesting thing is that that is not necessarily a particularly dangerous scenario in papillary thyroid cancer. It can be in the other types, but not in papillary. So you can be stage 4A and still do pretty well if you're managed properly. Stage 4C is the disease that spreads into other organs in patients over 45. And as we'll see, that carries a, a grim prognosis in many cases, although we do have some better treatment options now than we've had traditionally in the past. So what about this staging? What does it really mean for the patient? This graph on your screen right now is a study that was conducted here by my colleague, Dr. Ian Hay, a number of years ago, looking at almost 2,300 patients managed here at Mayo Clinic over a number of years and followed here for many, many years. And it's the outcome in terms of their survival uh, over a 25-year period from the time of the original treatment. The white line at the top is the outcome for patients with stage 1 disease. And you remember, these are young patients with disease contained within the neck, or older patients with very small tumors. And you can see that white line is almost a completely flat, horizontal line telling us that these individuals have an excellent uh, probability of living essentially a normal life expectancy. Our data goes out not just 25 years, but 35 and 45. And we have some patients who we followed for 60 years, uh, since before I was even born. And uh, many of those patients still alive, even at that late stage. So you can see that having stage 1 disease, in general, carries an excellent prognosis. Does that mean that nobody with stage 1 disease will ever die of this cancer? No. There is still a small risk from this cancer, and it's important to have a balanced view. This is not a good disease to have. It carries a threat. It needs to be managed properly. It needs to be uh, investigated properly and followed properly. But if we do things right, a very low chance that this disease is going to kill a person with stage 1 disease. You can also see stage 2 disease there. And again, this includes younger patients with disease that has spread already into the lungs. And it includes older patients with slightly bigger cancers. That red line which carries with it about a 97 to 98 percent chance of a normal life expectancy. So again, the outcome in this cancer, in general, is favorable for the majority of patients. That does not mean we should trivialize it. It does not mean we should ignore the possibility of it representing a threat. But most patients who are going to do well can be identified early on and can be uh, managed accordingly. As you can see, yellow line with stage 3 disease, not quite so good. These are patients with bigger tumors, with invasion into the soft tissues, and who are older than 45. And you can see one out of every five of those individuals is going to die of their cancer over the course of the next quarter of a century. And then look at the stage 4 disease. And these are patients with distant metastatic spread who are over 45. And in this particular study, conducted back in the 1990s, you can see that those patients did quite poorly, with an average life expectancy only of about three years. So this disease is real cancer. And in older patients, if it spreads, it carries a very significant risk to both life and health. And it needs to be managed properly. I want to emphasize that these data are now 20 years old. And that, of course, our ability to intervene in this disease has certainly improved, especially over the last 10 years. And I'm quite certain that 20 or 30 years from now, when we look back at the outcomes, we're going to see quite a different pattern in that stage 4 disease, because we're getting better. We're not perfect, but getting better at treating that disease. What about the other types, the follicular cancer on the left and the Herthel cell cancer on the right? And you'll see these so-called survival curves in the same way. And again, stage 1 and stage 2 disease, in general, carry a relatively favorable prognosis. Stage 3 disease, not quite so good. And stage 4 disease, pretty devastating stuff. Um, Five-year average survivals, uh, maybe 
eight-year average survivals for those patients with distant metastatic spread, disease that is spread outside of the neck in patients older than 45. So once again, I think the message I'm trying to convey here is that this is a real cancer and it deserves to be given due respect. Or too, is too often that we over-reassure the patient about what's going on. So putting it all together, we've got the tumor type itself and how that tumor tends to behave. We have the extent of the tumor, essentially a measurement of how long it's been growing in the neck and how fast it's been growing. And we have patient variables and factors that come into play. And we try to put these things all together so that we can give a patient diagnosed with thyroid cancer and being treated and followed for that cancer a better idea of what they really face. There have been several attempts to put these numbers together, put these factors together into a single number. And I've listed here just six of the different prognostic schemes that physicians sometimes use to characterize these tumors. The one that we at Mayo Clinic use, because Dr. Hay of Mayo Clinic invented it, is the MACIS scheme. That's the, the fourth one from the left, M-A-C-I-S. And what the MACIS scheme does is it takes the age of the patient when they're diagnosed, the size of the tumor, whether that tumor is invasive into the soft tissues of the neck, whether it has spread into other organs, and also how effective the treatment has been, how complete the surgery seems to have been. And it pushes those numbers through a formula and calculates a number, a single number, which I call my crystal ball number. And the crystal ball number gives us at least a good inkling of how well or badly this patient is likely to do. Uh, it's not a perfect answer. It's not going to predict everything that can go on in the future, but it gives a pretty good handle for patient and physician to start managing that individual's uh, thyroid cancer care. Here's what happens if we look at the survival of a patient over time uh, according to their MACIS score. And once again, you can see the majority of our patients here at Mayo and elsewhere around the country 83% of those individuals have a MACIS score of less than 6. And that MACIS score of less than 6 is what we define as being a low-risk patient. Not zero risk, but low risk. The yellow line at the top is the survival. And obviously, there's one or two patients, even with that low, low MACIS score, that go on to die of this cancer, but it's relatively uncommon. There is better than a 99% survival rate in patients with a MACIS score of less than 6 with papillary thyroid cancer. If your MACIS score is between 6 and 7, then the prognosis is not quite so good. If it's between 7 and 8, it's less good again. And greater than 8 starts to represent a real threat with an average life expectancy of only about 5 years with traditional treatments. So once again, it allows us to really stratify individuals diagnosed with thyroid cancer into those who need m aggressive treatments and those who can uh, get away with much less aggressive treatments and less intense follow-up. We find this to be a very useful thing in conjunction with the disease stage. It doesn't really matter which of these systems is in use, however. The stage, which is the top left graph, TNM, that's the other name for the AJCC classification, again splits patients quite nicely into low-risk patients on the bottom there with very, very small risk of dying, and the higher-risk patients with a higher chance of dying of this disease. I think it's a very useful strategy. Ages, AIMS, MASIS, all of these different systems give us the same type of information, just gathered in slightly different ways. But the key here is to know, are you in a low-risk group and can at least breathe some sigh of relief? Are you in a high-risk group where the treatment may have to be more aggressive and the follow-up much more intense? I find these systems to be very useful, and I encourage all of the physicians looking after patients with thyroid cancer to become familiar with these and to use them in their follow-up strategies. So what about treatment for thyroid cancer? How should we go about it? Once we've made a diagnosis of thyroid cancer, differentiated thyroid cancer, without a doubt, surgery is the primary treatment. I think the quality of that initial surgery really determines the long-term outcome for this disease more than any other single variable. Surgery is the treatment of choice, and everything else is an adjunct to surgery. The goal of that surgery is to get rid of the cancer, of course. But what we also encourage our surgeons to do is to remove as much of the remaining thyroid tissue as they can safely do. We talk about total thyroidectomy. 
um, in reality is not a 100% removal of the thyroid even when it's the best surgeon in the world doing this. There is a small remnant of thyroid tissue typically that remains behind. And it's important to understand that as a patient and a physician because when you go and have a whole body iodine scan or a measurement of thyroglobulin that's stimulated by thyrogen or by thyroid hormone withdrawal, you may have some detectable thyroid tissue. It doesn't automatically mean that there's cancer left behind. It may mean that the surgeon didn't do a 100% clearance of the thyroid. Perhaps it was only a 98% clearance of the thyroid, but so long as the cancer is out, that's okay. We think that the surgeon should be guided by preoperative staging using an ultrasound scan to develop a lymph node map so that the surgeon takes out those lymph nodes and that those lymph nodes should be taken out wherever they are, including that jugular chain of lymph nodes that I spoke about earlier, heading up towards the ear on each side, but only if that's indicated by the ultrasound scan preoperatively. The central lymph nodes should be taken out if they are involved, and there are some surgeons who believe they should be taken out even if they're not obviously involved. There's a big surgical argument between those people who believe that you should remove those lymph nodes and those people who believe that it's best not to go there. And the reason, again, is a balance of risk and benefit. Removal of those central compartment lymph nodes increases the risk of damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which controls the voice, and the parathyroid glands that control your calcium level. It's not uncommon for those parathyroids to be injured in any case with thyroid surgery, but the more extensive the surgeon the surgery that the surgeon does, the bigger the chance of that injury. So those central compartments should, in my view, at least be looked at and inspected with papillary cancer that is uh, bigger than a centimeter or so. They should probably be sampled and removed uh, so long as the surgeon has the surgical skills necessary to do that type of more advanced procedure. There's still a place for a lesser surgery. And in small tumors, less than about a centimeter or a half an inch, it is quite possible and quite safe for a surgeon only to remove a half of the thyroid gland. It does make the endocrinologist's job a little harder in the follow-up because the thyroglobulin test that we use, the blood test that tells us about remaining thyroid tissue, will pick up the presence of the other lobe. But that surgery is a very safe a very effective surgery for small papillary cancers, small papillary cancers that are uh, single focuses of cancer. If you have multiple little nodules of cancer, what we call multifocal disease, if lymph nodes are involved, or if there's certain other risk factors, then even for the small cancers, we should probably be taking out the whole thyroid gland. In other words, you need a bilateral, both sides procedure for patients with a strong family history of this type of thyroid cancer where it's likely the other lobe will be involved. People who've been exposed to neck radiation, especially in childhood, where the risk of another cancer developing on the other side is that much higher. Uh, those patients who have nodules on both lobes almost certainly should have both lobes taken out. Lymph nodes involved, both lobes should come out. And older patients and those at high risk, I think they're much better treated with a total removal of the thyroid, or at least as near total as the surgeon can safely do with appropriate lymph node removal as well. The extent of the dissection of the lymph nodes and the removal of those lymph nodes, as I've discussed, is, is an argument. Uh, there's certainly an argument in favor of the routine removal of those central compartment nodes for larger papillary cancers and for herthal cell cancers that might spread into those lymph nodes as well. The American Thyroid Association guidelines also say that radioactive iodine can be used as an alternative approach. That's a contentious area. Uh, many of us are not as uh, keen on the use of radioactive iodine because we don't think it's quite as effective as people have traditionally thought, uh, but I certainly think that radioactive iodine is used in many places as an alternative to a more dangerous and more extensive surgery, particularly where the surgeon may not have the skills to operate in that area safely. But if you do find ultrasound evidence of disease, then clearly removal of the entire compartment that contains those lymph nodes, the entire 
on-block resection is appropriate, removing everything that contains lymph nodes in that area. I don't think it's appropriate anymore for a surgeon to go in and just pick a few berries out of somebody's neck, leaving the rest of the lymph nodes behind. Because we should think of these lymph nodes much as we would think of a, a bunch of grapes. If there's one or two grapes, there's likely three or four. So we should be removing the entire set of lymph nodes. And the ATA as well has said we should certainly do that central lymph node removal if the patient is likely to fail with radioactive iodine. And that really is about the size of the lymph nodes, the number of the lymph nodes, the type of the cancer, and the age of the patient. And if there are adverse factors, then the surgeon should do that more extensive surgery unless there are very pressing reasons not to. What about radioactive iodine? It's commonly used, and I'm going to guess that the majority of the participants who are listening now who've had a thyroidectomy have also had radioactive iodine remnant ablation. And the way physicians often explain this to patients is that this radioactive iodine will remove whatever thyroid tissue that the surgeon may have left behind in doing their almost total removal of the thyroid. But in addition, they're told this will eliminate any remaining thyroid cancer that's left behind. And certainly that would be an admirable goal. The evidence that that's truly effective is weak. Uh, we uh, um, really doubt the strength of radioactive iodine to achieve those things, uh, but in some cases, at least, it's definitely worth a try. The question is, is it totally safe? I'm sure the question that each of you who've received radioactive iodine have asked of your physician before receiving this radiation treatment, does it cause cancer? And the answer is that in high doses, and especially with repeated high doses, there does seem to be an increased risk of developing other types of cancer, what we call second primary malignancies, other than thyroid cancer. So our view is that the risks of radioactive iodine are real but small. The benefits are often very small, especially in low-risk individuals. And so we believe here at Mayo Clinic that radioactive iodine should be used a little bit selectively. Well, that's also what the American Thyroid Association thinks, and you see on your screen now an uh, extract from the most recent guidelines for, the pa for physicians managing patients with thyroid cancer, and it's a slightly busy slide and a bit confusing. It takes a bit of studying, but in essence what this table says is that patients with small cancers uh, do not benefit from radioactive iodine and that radioactive iodine should not be recommended or used in those small cancers. In larger cancers, there's conflicting data. Some studies say that it's helpful. Other studies say that it's not helpful. Some studies actually say it may be harmful to use radioactive iodine in those larger studies, uh, sorry, in those larger tumors. And so we have to be selective in our use. And I think that's really what the ATA guidelines say. Low-risk patients do not benefit from and should not be exposed to radioactive iodine. High-risk patients, because they're at high risk, should be offered this opportunity for a treatment that may be of some use. But I'll tell you what my biggest concern always is, that in medicine there's a tendency for us to over-promise and under-deliver. And I think that it's unfair to take a patient who's facing a cancer and falsely promise that we can eliminate that remnant thyroid cancer that the surgeon left behind by using this treatment. We should be aware that as a weed killer for the weeds of thyroid cancer, radioactive iodine is relatively weak. And even if we use it, it does not guarantee that you will not have another problem in the future. So we need to be open to that, we need to be thinking about it, and we need to be following patients, whether we use radioactive iodine or not, we need to be following patients for evidence of leftover cancer. How much radiation should we use if we're going to use it? Well, the ATA says we should use the minimum amount of radiation necessary to achieve successful ablation. And I think that makes good sense. You and I don't want to be exposed to radiation that we don't need, and less radiation is always going to be safer than more radiation. There are many studies that show anywhere from 30 millicuries to 100 millicuries uh, showing similar rates of success when it comes to the ablation. Uh, it that remnant ablation can be done using either thyrogen, which we'll talk about in a minute, or following withdrawal of thyroid hormone. And whichever way you do it, it turns out that anywhere from 50 to 100 millicuries is going to be equally successful. 
Right now in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration approves remnant ablation using thyrogen only with a 100 millicurie dose of radioactive iodine. But there was a study presented in Paris last fall at a meeting I was lucky enough to attend and to hear this presentation uh, that suggests that a 50 millicurie dose using thyrogen is just as effective as a 100 millicurie dose. So why would we not use the lower dose? And I think what we'll find more and more is that physicians trend towards the lower dose of radioactive iodine to avoid exposing their patients to unnecessary radiation. So how should we do it? I've already said there are two options to treat with radioactive iodine for remnant ablation. The first option is to stop someone's thyroid hormone for a few weeks, allow that person to become hypothyroid, which is an unpleasant but not dangerous process for most people, and to then treat with the radioactive iodine and restart the thyroid hormone a day or two or three later. Option number two is to stimulate using thyrogen. And thyrogen is recombinant human TSH. It's genetically engineered. It's produced in big vats, and it's purified from those vats. And the product, the protein product, is thyrogen. Uh, it's actually recombinant human TSH marketed as thyrogen. Um, I think that thyrogen is a good drug uh, when it's available, but there are some issues. And we'll talk about the issues in a second. Why do I think it's a good drug? I think it's a good drug because it avoids hypothyroidism. And this is a study published a few years ago from a group in Italy looking at the impact of hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, on a sense of well-being, a, a, a general physical wellness scale. And on the left-hand side there, this thing called the SF36 mental summary score is simply asking patients, how well do you feel? And what you can see is patients with uh, no disease, patients with heart failure, patients who have thyroid cancer but are treated with levothyroxine, all of these patients have a similar quality of life. The patients who don't have a similar quality of life are patients either with depression, which certainly makes people feel miserable, uh, or patients who are hypothyroid, which actually makes them equally miserable as, as if they had depression. So hypothyroidism is a pretty miserable experience for most people, and I know many people on the call right now will have experienced hypothyroidism and will know exactly what I'm talking about. I can honestly say I've never experienced hypothyroidism, and I'm hoping I never do, uh, but I know many patients who have, and most of them would say, I don't really want to do that again if I can avoid it. I really would much rather go through the stimulation with recombinant human TSH or thyrogen. So what the heck is up with thyrogen? All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the challenges that we face today in even getting a hold of this drug. Well, what really happened, I think, as best I can tell from the information that Genzyme in Boston has released, my contacts both inside that organization and outside, is that there was a problem with some of the paperwork. As you can imagine, if you're producing a drug for human consumption and human use, especially an injectable drug, you really have to have a high level of quality control in the production of that product. But it's not good enough just to have a high level of quality control. You have to actually prove to the Fruit and Drug Administration that your quality control is as good as you say it is. You want to be able to go back and say, here's the paperwork that proves that our guy who signed off on this drug really did his job properly. Well, it turns out some of that paperwork was messed up uh, in the organization, within Genzyme, in their manufacturing plant. And there were a number of concerns and problems expressed, and the Food and Drug Administration went in and gave them a slap on the hands and went back in, and it wasn't fixed properly. I don't know how many rounds of this went on, but finally the Food and Drug Administration said there is a patient safety issue concern. We've got no evidence that anybody has been harmed at this point, but we are concerned that patients could be harmed in the future if we don't fix this problem. And therefore, Genzyme, you are going to shut down the production line until you can resolve these issues. Well, unfortunately, Genzyme is the only company that makes thyrogen. They have a patent on it. And nobody else can make it in the meantime. And there's a patient safety concern about this drug. The negotiation went on, and the final agreement from the Food and Drug Administration with Genzyme is that they could move the manufacturing to another plant, start the production lines again, and bring the supply back online. And that was supposed to happen a few months ago. 
but unfortunately there have been some quality control issues at the new plant, as I understand it as well, and there continues to be an issue with the production of this drug. I think there's many angry patients out there because of that, because many patients are being told they have no choice but to become hypothyroid again, which nobody really wants to do. And there's, of course, concern amongst physicians about whether thyrogen is really going to be uh, worth the trouble that it's causing this company. That concern has been amplified because Genzyme, who makes Thyrogen, was recently bought out by Sanofi, which is a French-based pharmaceutical company, and there's concern that this may be too much of a thorn in the side for the new owners, and they might be tempted to get rid of it altogether and make Thyrogen unavailable. I think that would be a terrible shame. It would be really bad for patients, and I think it would be uh, really a problem for us as physicians looking after those patients. And so I've asked the question directly of the company, and their senior sales and marketing manager has spoken to me and reassured me that Sanofi is 100% behind the product, that they will do whatever is necessary to fix this problem, but that it is going to take a little time. And the prediction right now is that supply problems for this drug will continue for the next year, possibly even two years, before the issues are completely resolved. But at the end of the day, they have promised me face-to-face uh, -face that this is a problem that they are going to fix. So for patients who can wait, we should probably be willing to wait. For patients who can't, hypothyroidism may be an undesirable uh, option, but it may be the only option available. I said already uh, that 30 to 100 millicuries is equally effective during withdrawal. It's equally effective using thyrogen. And although the Food and Drug Administration says a 100 millicurie dose with thyrogen, many of us are moving to those lower doses already. And I think that should certainly be encouraged by the publication of this new study. What about high-risk thyroid cancer? What should we do with patients who are at the other end of the spectrum as far as radioactive iodine is concerned? Well, in my view and in the view of the American Thyroid Association, those individuals should have remnant ablation to eliminate the thyroid remnant, but also should be considered for much higher dose treatment to kill residual cancer. If your surgeon does the surgery and discovers that he's left cancer behind, I think it is appropriate for that cancer to be treated by whatever means necessary. And here I think that radioactive iodine may play a role in much higher doses than just the remnant ablation. But we've got to remember one thing, and that is that many of these more advanced cancers are less well differentiated. They're less uh, indolent in their growth pattern. They tend to be a bit more aggressive, not always, but many times. And those more aggressive cancers often don't actually concentrate the iodine. So the cancer where we really need the radioactive iodine to work is the very cancer where the radioactive iodine cannot work. And that can be a real problem. So once again, it's important for physicians to understand that and not to rely exclusively on radioactive iodine in those high-risk individuals. So patients with extensive invasive disease, patients where the surgeon can't remove that disease completely, in addition to radioactive iodine, it may be necessary for those people to consider external beam radiation therapy, so-called XRT, um, as a way to manage that disease. Once that initial treatment is done, uh, what should we do? We've got to remember that you may be at risk for two different things here, for older patients, for patients with distant spread, for larger and invasive tumors, for incompletely removed tumors, what we worry about is this cancer coming back and killing people. For younger patients where the disease has been left behind but the biology of the disease suggests it's less aggressive, for patients who have lymph node involvement, the risk really is for recurrence. And these two things are different. Risk for recurrence and the risk for death are separate from one another. So we've got to pay attention to the patterns of spread. Papillary cancer spreads within the thyroid gland. The other ones don't. There's local invasion that occurs with papillary cancer, but it tends to be quite late in the disease, whereas herthal cell and anaplastic thyroid cancer is more aggressive and happens earlier. Its lymph nodes are the real problem with papillary cancer. More than 60%, in some studies as many as 80 or 90% of patients with papillary cancer have lymph nodes involved. So if you have a detectable thyroglobulin after your surgery from a papillary cancer, lymph nodes are the first place I would be looking. Spread into other organs with papillary cancer occurs late, not early, um, but other organs can be affected. LB means lungs and bone, 
BLS, bones, lung, and soft tissues. And you can see here that follicular and herthal cell cancer are more likely to involve the soft tissues than is the papillary cancer. The growth rate for most papillaries is slow, that for follicular and herthal cell a little faster. And it's only about 80% of papillary cancers that concentrate the radioactive iodine. And that's even some of the less aggressive forms of that cancer. So do remember, radioactive iodine is not a perfect solution, because one out of five of those cancers cannot respond because it doesn't concentrate the iodine. What about life threat? Papillary cancer carries a low life threat. Follicular and herthal cell cancer are more moderate life threat. I do want to emphasize, though, that low risk is not the same as no risk. And therefore, we should be paying close attention to this cancer and not trivializing it, as I've said already. Here's a few common myths uh, before we go off to uh, the question and answer session. Common myths. Don't worry, it's only thyroid cancer. I'm willing to bet that almost everybody in the group here has heard that statement, and it's one that really bothers me. Anything the surgeon leaves behind that radioactive iodine will clear up. Well, I've already discussed that that's a myth, because it certainly uh, cannot be expected to do anything after a poor surgery. No one ever dies of thyroid cancer. I have so many people I know, close friends, who've had that outcome that this makes me incredibly angry. It's a good cancer. If I had to choose a cancer, this is the one I would choose. I tell my patients, if I had to choose a cancer, the cancer would be in somebody else altogether. I don't think there is such a thing as a good cancer, and I would prefer not to be diagnosed with any form of malignancy, but certainly not thyroid cancer. There are a few more slides in the deck, which I will be available after the fact, but I would like to uh, open up the uh, uh, discussion to questions, so we have a few minutes to address those questions. So I'll pass back to Jan, who's selecting the questions, and will be reading them to me. Jan, thank you very much. Hello, Jan. Are you there? Thank you very much. I, I do want to say that we have a lot of questions that we will not be able to get to. And we will hope to be able to triage some of those and perhaps respond to them offline. Um, we, will, we will be in touch with the group via the FICA, uh, the FICA listserv. So with that being said, let's start off with some questions. And keeping in mind that this is a primer, for basic information, we're going to start with the first question, which is, what is considered a big tumor, in, particularly in terms of milliliters? So we generally measure these tumors as far uh, in terms of uh, the largest diameter. Tumors are generally quite round and spherical, but they often have one diameter that's bigger than another. So we measure the largest diameter, and we define it in centimeters or millimeters. Big tumors, for most of us who are involved in this field, is anything over four centimeters we would consider big. Small tumors, anything less than one centimeter. So it's the one centimeter and four centimeter uh, cutoffs that we use. Um, but this is not an absolute thing. It's not that four centimeters and above is always deadly, and anything less than four centimeters is safe. This is a gradation. The bigger the tumor, the longer it's had to grow and develop, and so the more chance of problems and tumor size matters, no matter where on that scale it is. Thank you. So is a mix of papillary and follicular more, does it represent more of a risk? The uh, normal situation is that that mix of papillary and follicular is actually not a true mix of two different cancers. It's one cancer that shows features of both. And most of the time, that gets defined as being a follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer. It's actually a papillary cancer, not a follicular cancer. When it's that uh, follicular variant, it may have slightly different growth patterns, a tendency to spread locally more than it does to spread to lymph nodes. And so we have to look in different ways when it's that way. But overall, the prognosis, when we take account of the patient's age and the stage and the success of the surgery, the prognosis is identical to the standard papillary cancer. Thank you. Does follicular in children behave differently from that in adults? Age matters in the outcome of these cancers, no matter what type of cancer it is. Follicular cancer in young people, especially in children, uh, almost certainly is a less nasty cancer than it would be in a 65 or 70-year-old. 
Follicular cancer in children, however, is very rare. So there are very few studies that have really looked at those outcomes in, a, in a, an effective way. And I think that if I was seeing a young person with follicular cancer, I would certainly want to watch that individual very, very closely indeed uh, in case our studies are actually wrong. One of the challenges with these types of thyroid cancer is that the numbers are always very small because thyroid cancer is relatively rare. So there's some uncertainty about that in follicular cancers. Okay, thank you. So now this one's a little more complex. So there, how long does a dose of radioactive iodine keep working? So if it's been, say, six months since the treatment and an area in the lung that initially took up um, took it up in the post-treatment scan was negative and then was negative yeah how long does, yeah. yeah and then 11 and then 11 months later the the area resolved on the CT scan so so I, I can answer that question I think only with anecdote not with much in the way of data because we don't really have uh, a good way to measure the effectiveness of radioactive over time radioactivity over time. What I can say, the radiation itself dissipates quite quickly. So patients after a week or two are no longer going to have any radiation hanging around in their system. But the impact in killing disease, especially disease that spread into the lungs, that impact can carry on for quite a period of time because it will often set up an inflammatory response. We think the immune system is coming in and mopping up some of the damaged cancer. So I have one young woman I look after who was last treated with radioactive iodine about uh, five years ago now. This was a disease that was spread through both of her lungs, and we treated her with quite high doses of radioactive iodine, a total of more than 600 millicuries, which is a lot of uh, radiation. And what we've done since then is simply watch. And every time I see her, there's less disease than there was the time before, lower measurement of thyroglobulin, and CAT scans and other images of the chest showing less burden of disease. And we've seen that effectiveness of the radioactive iodine treatment continue to function over time. How much of it is really the radiation doing that? How much of it is her own immune system attacking that cancer? I can't tell. But I can say that she seems to be getting better, not worse, over time. So sometimes you can see that benefit happen over many, many years. Thank you. So still talking about radioactive iodine, what's the risk of having had to chew the pill? I don't think that the uh, chew the pill versus swallow the pill really makes a lot of difference because most of the time if you're going to take that capsule, bite on it or, or chew it and release the radioactivity into your mouth, you're immediately going to swallow it anyway. So whether it's in the form of liquid or capsule, uh, I don't think the risks really change. The risks are determined by uh, the dose you receive and by how quickly you excrete the remainder of the stuff that doesn't get into the thyroid cancer. So most of the time you'll be admitted to the hospital or if you're doing it as an outpatient you'll be advised to drink plenty of fluids after you've taken that and the goal of drinking plenty of fluids is to flush your system through. Anything that has not been taken up into the cancer should be excreted in the urine and passed out uh, that way and if you can eliminate that residual unused radiation then you minimize your own body's exposure. The real risk of that radiation though, saliva gland injury, drying up the saliva glands causing dry mouth and permitting dental problems in the future, uh, tear duct injury caused by the radiation being excreted in the tears and scarring the tear duct with watering eyes and, uh, and dry eyes down the line. Uh, all of those things are, are real but have tended to be underestimated by physicians. We tend to just brush it off saying it's a minor thing. For many patients, it's not minor at all. It's actually life-altering, and I think we should be paying attention to that as well as the issue of long-term malignancy risk. Thank you. So na the next question is a monitoring question, and, I th and it's one where somebody's been followed, they've had their total thyroidectomy, and they're, with the they're popular with follicular variants and they've had their thyroidectomy, and in fact, several years later, they had a follow-up lymph node dissection. So their endocrinologist who's been following them, they check their thyroglobulin and the TSH, but now their internist wants them to have an ultrasound, a thyroid ultrasound. But the endo, endo says it's not necessary according to current recommendations. So any comments on how, number one, the which which school you are 
belong to, and secondly, how uh, someone deals with these uh, discordant recommendations. Discordant recommendations seem to be the norm in thyroid cancer, and part of the problem is that a lot of the um, strategies we use for follow-up have been developed within an individual institution. And if you as a fellow or a resident in endocrinology train in that institution, then that's the way you practice when you go out and do your own thing. There hasn't really been an overarching recommendation for the entire country, much less the entire world, until these American Thyroid Association guidelines came out first in 2006 and then revised in 2009. And although it seems strange to many people who aren't in the profession, it takes quite a long time for those kinds of recommendations to be fully adopted, even if they're absolutely correct and, and appropriate. So it doesn't surprise me that there's some discordance. There are multiple different ways you can approach the follow-up of a low-risk thyroid cancer, but it sounds as though this individual is not at the lowest of risk because they've already had a recurrence and they've already had lymph nodes involved. So this is the kind of situation where we at Mayo Clinic would definitely be keen to use ultrasound for a number of years after the last recurrence. And perhaps that should be five years or seven years or ten years. I think there's a lot of argument you can have in that regard. But we think the ultrasound is a great tool. You will sometimes see patients who have a zero recording of thyroglobulin. After stimulation with thyrogen or withdrawal, it still is a zero. And yet when we do the ultrasound, we find a little spot of that thyroid cancer hiding out on a lymph node. So we do find it to be a useful tool in that regard. And I would tend towards doing the ultrasound. There does come a point, though, where it's not worth doing anymore. If the last time you had thyroid cancer was 35 years ago and your thyroglobulin is zero, in essence, you're cured, and there's not much advantage of uh, adding on an ultrasound onto that situation. And the question is where we stop doing ultrasounds is not very well defined. Here at Mayo, for low-risk thyroid cancer, typically seven to 10 years after the last recurrence of the cancer. And if everything is clear at that point and the thyroglobulin remains zero in an otherwise low-risk patient, we would generally stop doing those ultrasounds or other images at that time. Thank you. So these next two questions, I'm going to sort of intertwine them. And, and I know that they're questions that frequently come into people, people encounter. So one other question is, once you've had your, just had your thyroidectomy and getting the medication adjusted correctly, so that it doesn't take too long. And, I, and I'm presuming that they're talking about the levothyroxine. And along the same line is how do you balance suppressing the TSH and then the side effects of it? So those are really excellent questions and I think a source of great deal of angst and confusion amongst both patients and physicians. So when I'm sending a patient home after thyroid surgery, the first thing I do is find out how much they weigh because their weight tells me almost exactly what dose of thyroid hormone they're going to require. And with a little bit of judgment, we can come up with a dose that's going to be right almost all the time. Young men need bigger doses than older women do, so there's a little adjustment for gender and size and muscularity. But it's not a difficult thing to come up with that suggestion. It's really important for a patient to take the thyroid hormone the right way, and, and many times patients are never told this that the best way to take thyroid hormone is on an empty stomach with no other medication taken at the same time at least, at least 30 to 60 minutes before eating or drinking anything else, and that medicine washed down with a little glass of water at most. Some people prefer to take that first thing in the morning. That's legitimate, and that's the way I prefer it. Some people prefer to take it before their evening meal, for example, when they still have an empty stomach you know, from a lunch a number of hours ago. I think it's not so important about when, although I generally cancel first thing in the morning, but how you take the thyroid hormone is really important. Second issue is that it's got to be taken regularly and reliably. And I think every patient who's had thyroid cancer is pretty motivated to take it regularly and reliably because it's part of the ongoing management of their disease. But at the same time, everybody on this line is a human being, and all of us miss out our medications once in a while. I know that I do when it comes to my blood pressure medicine and my cholesterol medicine. So I think that just being certain that you're really getting as, the tablet as regularly as you think you are is a helpful tool. What I encourage my patients to do if we're struggling with uh, not stabilizing the TSH is count the number of tablets they have left in their bottle. 
And it's amazing how often somebody will discover that actually they've been missing out one or two in a month that they didn't realize, and it makes a big difference. Um, once you uh, have got the self-administration right and your doctor's calculated a good dose for you, the next thing is to just measure that TSH. I also measure the free thyroxine, by the way, and then you can adjust the dose of the thyroid hormone to optimize that level of TSH. Um, it, it needs small adjustments infrequently. Anybody who's getting an adjustment done more than, say, once in a year or once every two or three years, that's way too many adjustments. I hear sometimes people being adjusted every six weeks or every eight weeks. I think this should be regarded as a bit like driving on an icy road. It's something we do a lot here in the winter in Minnesota. And if we drive on an icy road, you want to make very gentle, very small adjustments, very infrequently, just to keep the car moving in the right direction. I think of that with the adjustments to thyroid hormone as well. Too many adjustments, too large a change, always should be discouraged. And the reason I like to measure the free thyroxine as well as the TSH is because it's a better way for me to judge whether we are close to where we need to be or not. The TSH is an amplified view, and it sometimes confuses us a little. Um, uh, the other part of that question was, what should we do about balancing side effects with the desire to suppress the TSH? Well, I think we should always be willing to compromise, and we should judge the level of compromise based on the risk the individual faces. If I'm seeing a patient who's had a small cancer, it's a low-risk cancer, it's been completely removed, there's no evidence of leftover disease, I don't feel the need to suppress that TSH. We can get away with normal TSH. Maybe I'll hold it towards the low end of the normal range rather than the high end of the normal range, but it doesn't need to be 0.01. On the other hand, if I have a patient who has a high-risk cancer, there was cancer left behind, we've done multiple rounds of radioactive iodine treatment, we're considering external beam radiation, all of these types of things, I think there's a desire to suppress that TSH a bit more aggressively and tolerate whatever side effects might come along. But always there's got to be a discussion and a compromise because there's no point in having this cancer under control but at the same time making our patients' lives a misery. And some people are very sensitive to over-treatment with thyroid hormone and get a lot of side effects and a lot of problems. We need to be willing to listen to that and to compromise. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for not only those answers but the presentation overall. And uh, before we finish up, I want to remind everybody to go ahead and look on FICA.org for the remaining sessions of this summer series, as well as for the information regarding the, the National Conference in Los Angeles this fall in October. And with that, I'd like to say I hope to see everybody there in Los Angeles. And thank you again, Dr. MacGyver. And thank, thank you very much. A pleasure.